closed down. Share the adventures of our early pioneers as we explore the development of the Pacific Northwest and beyond with your host, Mike Roberts, and historian, Bill Barley. Welcome to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. Mike Roberts and Bill Barley with you today. And we're going to head back up to uh, the caribou country. I mean, we've done that enough times with sure. all sorts of other things. But uh, one story we've not told ever before, and it's really amazingly early. Yeah, it is. That's the uh, old Ward's Camp, or Horsefly, as we call it today, and the name was changed from Ward's Camp to Horsefly. And probably the, the first gold strike was made there. And the reason, of course, was because of the Fraser River. Uh, when they discovered about two tons or three tons of gold on Hill's Bar, that flashed all around the mining world, and the American miners poured into British Columbia and realized that Hill's Bar, beyond Hill's Bar, the real gold was probably still to be had. So they began making that treacherous trip to the Fraser Canyon. And here's a, here's a photograph of the Fraser Canyon as it looked about that time. And it was really quite, a, quite an obstacle indeed. <laughs> and the, the big town then, of course, the metropolis of the interior was old Yale, Mike. And here's, here's a photograph of Yale in the early, early days. And um, there's another one right here, which is a little bit later. And so Yale was a very, very important it was the jumping off spot into the interior of British Columbia. Well, when they figured that there had to be the load for all of this placer gold somewhere, sure. it must have been just like a stampede. Sure, they fanned out in every direction. Okay, going to take a break and be back in just a moment to tell you the story of horsefly and why it's called horsefly right after these words. Now, I'm going to talk about a place uh, that eventually called Horsefly, but it goes under all sorts of names. Ward's Camp or something like that. Where yeah. does it start? Well, it starts really with, with uh, many bands of American miners, mostly Californians, going up the Fraser River. Some of them went as far as the mouth of the Chilcotin. And one band of six miners, all Americans, went as far as the mouth of the Chilcotin. And that was a guy called Jim Sellers, Ira Crow, the three M's, uh, McLean, Manatee, and Mordecai, and, uh, and the leader of men who was a guy called Peter Dunleavy. And Dunleavy was a very interesting guy, about 5 feet 10 inches tall, blue eyes, uh, blonde hair, and he had a compelling sort of uh, a charm that people really could not ignore. And it served him very well in later life. And uh, an Indian wandered into camp, an Indian called Toma. He was actually the son of uh, Lola and Paul, one of the Kamloops uh, Shoe Swap chiefs. And they treated him very well. He uh, wanted tea, and they gave him tea, and they, and they talked to him in Chinook and so on. So he, in turn, returned that, uh, that courtesy. And he said, um, you know, you're looking for and he, he, the Indian name for gold. And um, he said, I have a friend of mine called Long Baptiste, he said. He knows where, where to find gold. And he said, I don't know the country as well as he does, but I will lead you to him. So eventually, uh, they go to Kamloops. And that's rather interesting, because... Um, and, and, they didn't uh, want to do the Fraser thing again. No, they didn't want to tackle <laughs> Fraser. They went to get their supplies at Camus. They were running short on, on grub and so on. So they went into Camus, and Camus was a, was, a, was a rolling, rollicking town at that Hudson's time. Small, Bay Company. small Hudson's Bay right. uh, post, actually. And, um, and there were a number of American miners there, not too good. They were trying to ply some of the young Indian girls with, uh, with liquor. And, uh, and Dunleavy was watching this, sitting back in the corner and watching this, not approving of it. And in strode a huge Indian, about six feet, three or four inches tall, looked at this scene, went over, grabbed the ball out of their hands, smashed it on the floor, told the girls to go back to their families, and turned his, intentionally turned his back on these armed Americans. Just said, I am they treating you with you. disdain. That's right, I dare you. They didn't move a muscle. And uh, <laughs> Dunleavy, on the back of my neck standing up, though. <laughs> right. Dunleavy was very impressed, and as he turned around, the Indian turned around, he noticed he had a gold ring hand-fashioned in the back of one of his braids. Quite a heavy gold ring, natural gold, obviously made out of a nugget. And he was curious about this, so he, he talked to uh, he talked to Long Baptiste, and he said, where did you get that? He said, my father was killed hunting grizzly bear on the Indian name of a creek, which is now Goose Creek, which was a gold creek, by the way, and uh, quite quite well known on, the, on, on Caribou Lake on the east side. And um, so he, he said, well, can you lead me to where you think there is gold? Uh, Baptiste said, yeah, yes, I think I can. He said, I don't know much about it, but I know the country extremely well. So they went up to Lac La Hache, and at Lac La Hache, they, they stopped there, and they were invited to a great Indian gathering. All the chiefs of the Chilcotin and the Shuswap and the Dene or the Carriers were there, and they were trying to decide at that time 
whether or not they would drive the whites out of that area, which is very interesting. So John Levy and his crew are his actually, crew were actually, actually invited. They were considered friends, and they were invited there. And, and finally, they decided the whites were too numerous and too powerful, and they would attempt to get along with them. And this was the upshot of that, that 1859 conference at Lacklehash. And so anyway, uh, Long Baptiste, he decides to, to lead them up through a convoluted route up into a, an unknown river. This unknown river was the Horsefly River. They set the panning, and of course, they, they began to get very, very coarse colors indeed. And uh, so they realized, and they were followed by other miners very quickly thereafter, by the way, including some Chinese miners who, who picked up behind them. And, and very soon, of course, the caribou itself came into, came into the forefront with strikes on Lightning Creek and strikes on Antler Creek and, and strikes on, on famous Williams sure. Creek. I mean, take a look at some of these pictures. Here are these sure. guys who are, who are part of the contingent of prospectors sure. coming up, washing the gold there, and look at all the rock that's yeah, been well, piled that's on the side. Because that's, that's what we call flat wash in, 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 in mining terminology or plaster mining terminology or parlance. When you get flat wash like that, invariably you're into good gold. Now, Lao He looks like a Chinese name. What yeah, is this, that's from the great Lao He Society in Yale and Richard Willoughby. This is a Lao He Gulch, so he, he, he was the first one to mine Lao He Gulch, so he, would, he named that Lao He Gulch. Cameron Town. Look, at there's, a, there's sure. a burgeoning place with lots of people with, with time on their yeah. hands. To and uh, Caribou Cameron and Bobby Stevenson are in that photograph, in the center of the photograph, and Caribou Cameron took out over half, well, he took out a ton of gold himself. Mucho Oro Mine. What a great name. Yeah, that's a deep shaft mine. You can see that from the shaft house. And Richfield. Look at, look at the, all of those piles of gravel all yeah, around the side. The tailings, that's, actually. That's previously washed. And the, yeah. and the look at the, I can't get over the carpentry that took yeah. place yeah. in these places. Yeah. And as the uh, sluice boxes or the, what do, you, what do you call them, the things that carry, the aqueducts carrying water from one spot to well, the next. Well, some of them are boxes, some of them are just flumes. Yeah. And this Richfield. Look at the, yeah. the mountain, the forest was just scalped back and, yeah. and uh, all that was dragged out of there. Yeah, it, it's very, very fascinating. And, uh, and a lot of towns sprung up. And, and so, so actually what happens, now this is an interesting shot. This shows, uh, this shows some cattle being driven through the main street of Barkerville about 1868. And, this is, and the, these, these cattle probably belonged to the Harper brothers at that time. Jerome Harper was still alive. He died, what, 1870? And his brother Thaddeus. So they drove cattle into the, into the gold fields until it started to decline. An interesting story here, Mike. Because when it did start to decline, Thaddeus, Thaddeus Harper decided he would drive 800 cattle all the way to Chicago. I guess he looked at the map and it looked awful easy. You know, it isn't very far on a map. But he had to get to Salt Lake City first. This is, uh, you know, about 1872 by this time. And uh, so he drives 800 cattle all the way down through that open country. And they're grazing all the way pretty well. And he picks up so more cattle. So he'd go through Kamloops and then down the Seriously. Okanagan, maybe? And, yeah. Uh, I don't know whether he came up the, the Okanagan route or went over the Snoqualmie, but probably the Okanagan route. He picks up another 400 cattle. Now he has 1,200 cattle. Goes down to Washington State and realizes he's still about 600 miles from Salt Lake City, where he has to make the connection to, to ship them to Chicago. So he decides, well, I better look for some free grant. He expected $15 a cow. That's what he expected. $15 a head, that's all. And, and if he said that, he'd make a reasonable profit. So then he went into Idaho for some free grants, and at the precise time he went into Idaho, he's been there about 14, 15 months now on this, on this long this is cattle drive. a lot drive. longer than he'd ever wanted to be with any <laughs> yeah. cattle. Didn't cost him much. Look, the cattle are eating free. Yeah. And a huge drought hits California, the worst they'd had in decades, and about half the cattle in the corner of California are wiped out. Well, he sees the opportunity. He said, hey, it's just as close to California as it is to Salt Lake City. So, and much easier route yeah, to travel. Sure. So he drives down to California. He gets $70 a head, practically five times as much as he, as he would have got. He would have got $18,000. He gets $84,000. So he picks up a profit of about $65,000. $65, he is absolutely astonished. It puts him on the road. He goes back into that country that he knew so well, and he goes back into the horsefly, and he realizes that some people there are doing very, very well. The and Chinese, I've got this little cash laying on my hands here. You bet he has. He decides to get into mining and does so in a kind of a, uh, a desultory way. The Chinese are doing very well in a hot spot on the Horsefly River. Extremely coarse gold indeed. So he comes in there and he gets some ground. And other people are prospecting all the way through there. But he's beaten by a guy called R.T. Ward. W-A-R-D. And Ward goes in and buys that Chinese ground. They had probably taken out 50,000 ounces at that time. And it's a bit of a guessing game because the Chinese were extremely close mouthed. He goes in there and puts in what we call a hydraulic, 
towards one hydraulic. Of those, one of those uh, that cannons lifts the, that just fires the water? No, no, it What's lifts this? it. It's, it. It's a hydraulic elevator, and it lifts that gravel up so he can work that gravel. Came from actually uh, from California originally, the idea. So here's a picture of his hydraulic mine. In, and it's one of the few, I think it may be the only picture of Ward's hydraulic mine, about 1895. Looks like it could taken. be a conceivably an expensive operation. Very expensive, but he dug extremely well. He takes out about 50,000 ounces himself. So that's worth about $800,000. So Ward dug extremely well. Now, why would anybody call the place Horsefly? What was the... I mean, this is not what I call the gold medal winning name <laughs> oh, for any place. It isn't that attractive. The people in Horsefly like it. And I don't mind it either. But the reason was, when the miners went in there, and the horses went in there, and any, any cattle, they had to actually wear hoods to keep away from the mosquitoes and the horse flies. Hoods on the horses? Yes, that's right. Hoods and on the horses and on the men. Oh, I'm, I'm, I, every time I Stay think away. of... Uh, what it took to get gold out of the ground. Yeah. Anybody who suffered oh, a yeah. horsefly bite, uh, and these uh, were, these were hungry, actual hoods. Oh yeah, should have been. Well, that must yeah. have made it really comfy getting gold out of the ground yeah. wearing a hood. Yeah, and and so all through the 1890s, they're working all along that 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 horsefly river, looking for an extension of this hot spot, a very very hot spot. All right seems to have left that little line with three dots at the end. Take a break and continue our discussion of horsefly and other spots in the caribou after this break. Ghost Towns, Mike Roberts and Bill Barley and talking today about horsefly yes. and the gold which Ward found, which Dunleavy found, yeah. and it attracted a lot of other folks, including yeah. one with immense fame, this guy Hobson. Yeah, J.D. Hobson, a bully and bully and pit fame, said, hey, this looks like pretty good ground to me. He went in there and put in a big operation, spent about $250,000, and he was a very, very good miner. He took out $150,000. Cost him a little money to get in there. Yeah, it did. And uh, so essentially he ran into cemented gravels, which they tried to break apart with a ball mill and weren't even successful then, which is very interesting. So he pulls out, goes back to the bullion pit, and produces a mountain of ore. In fact, there's a very, very funny story, Mike, and this is, this is a story that's gone through the Caribou for many, many years. Wasn't admitted, I don't think, in the official records by the British Columbia Express, but we think it took place. Uh, just out of just out of a 150-mile house, or 100-mile house, I think it was 150, they were bringing down gold from, from Hobson's uh, bullion pit, and there was a 350-pound ingot. 350 pounds. That's one of those great bullet-shaped things that you were talking right. about before. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I've got a picture of them somewhere if I remember find the picture, Mike. <laughs> and so anyway, they had this in the stagecoach. They were held up by, by two or three uh, armed robbers, and uh, they roll this thing out of the stagecoach, and the stagecoach whips on its way and finally comes back with a posse about four hours later. The uh, robbers are nowhere to be found, but they're sitting in the center of the road. There's a 350-pound <laughs> ingot of gold. They couldn't move it, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Very wise. I hadn't thought of that. Put the gold into such a huge lump that nobody can steal it. That's right. How would you have hauled it away? You There's only you had to put it in a wagon. Can't cut it with an axe. You can't hang it on one side of a horse. And they can track a wagon. So I, you know, it was it was a great ploy. It worked like a charm. And that was probably J.B. Hobbins' very very fine mind working overtime. And what happens, of course, is after this, a uh, horsefly goes into a bit of a decline. But other areas around don't. Mm -hmm. And two areas we'll mention very briefly. One is a 150 mile house. Now, was this anything more than just a way station on the Caribou Road? It's a distribution point, but it goes both ways. It goes north, it goes south, and it goes east. So, so 150 mile house, it gives you an idea. This is how it looks. This is kind of a pan view of the area. There's a trading post there. There's oh, yeah. uh, farms sure. there. There's a supply yeah. point for everybody. Yeah, and here's a second shot of 150 mile house showing more detail. Really quite an attractive place, Mike. Yeah. And the other place was kind of interesting, came into its own in uh, about the early 1860s. And who was there waiting for this boom to happen but Peter Dunleavy? Oh, we haven't heard his name for a while. So no, that's right. After he got disenchanted with... Uh, Horsefly, yeah. he wandered away. He decided to make the money off, uh, off trading rather than he traded with the Indians. So he establishes in a place called Soda Creek, which is as far, you know, where the stern wheelers go. Now, and Soda Creek uh, is right on the Fraser. Hence, sure. that's where the stern wheelers, that's and right. this shot shows one of those stern wheelers, the Enterprise. That's the Enterprise. That, that's a very, very moody shot of, uh, of Soda Creek. And, and I even like Soda Creek today. I like the feel of the area. Yeah, and there you can see the hotel up yeah, on you the can. bench. But and an even better shot. Boy, that looks actually a huge hotel. Sure. 
and that's uh, that's marvelous. That's the colonial. And look at all of the and, people uh, under the oh, under the sure, awnings there. Sure. There's a bunch of folks there. Yeah, and everybody gathered. The hotel acted as a bank. It acted as a grocery store. It acted as a send-off place. The Teamsters would come in here and uh, and and put their goods on board the Enterprise. Or would, and Captain Bone Doan was probably I think he was captain of the Enterprise then, and right before him. So uh, it was a, it was a it, it, he did extremely well here indeed, Mike. So Dunleavy, he, he rose to the top, but not as a sure. result of any gold at this stage, but as a result of him just knowing what would last longest. Yeah, but there were guys going back with gold. And I, I mentioned one of, these, one of these individuals before, Mike, and he's kind of a fascinating guy. And uh, Diller, Bill Diller. And uh, Diller had come into the Caribou Gold Fields, and I mentioned, I think, five or six years ago, that he, he said he would not leave until he had his own weight in gold. Well, he weighed 240 pounds. He was a big boy. So he got his 240 pounds, and he thought, I'll fudge a little bit. My dog weighs about you know, 45 pounds, This is the guy who had too. the dog, and yeah. he and his dog left with uh, their weight in gold. Yeah, they did indeed. He, he didn't so he, profligate himself to he, death or anything. He took about 285 pounds of gold out of the gold fields of the caribou. And interesting follow-up to the story. He'd come from New York State, which is kind of unlikely. You'd think he'd come from California, but he hadn't. And he hadn't seen his mother for some years. And, of course, the, the postal system wasn't perfect at that time, although most of the letters got through. And he decided to go back, and she was getting on. And he knew she was, and he'd been sending her a little bit of money, but didn't realize she was in very dire circumstances. He goes back to his, to his, to his family farm, arrives on a day, and notices there's a huge crowd there, Mike. And there is a huge crowd there. And he listens for a moment, and he hears the auctioneer saying, everything from this farm is up for sale. And he looks beyond the auctioneer, and there's old mother is sitting there, and she's crying because the farm is up for sale. All our precious belongings are going. She is essentially bankrupt. So Diller steps up. He had, by this time, converted a lot of this money into gold, uh, into gold coin, either eagles or double eagles or, or half eagles. And everything that's bid, this stranger bids a little higher. Nobody takes one item off that farm. And finally, the auctioneer says, and now for the farmhouse and the farm, do we have a bid? And there were a number of bids. Diller overbids all of them, picks up the, the, uh, the paper to the farm, walks over to his mother, kisses her on the cheek, oh. said, it's your son. She didn't recognize him. He had a heavy growth of, uh, of whiskers, and he'd, he'd add a little bit of weight at 240-odd pounds, and he, the prodigal son returns home. What a spectacular story. Yeah. yeah. And he uh, arrives he the day of the auction of his life. The day of the auction, yeah. What a great story. Yeah, it, it's really quite you, a... Yeah, I, I love the story. Do yeah. you believe it? Yeah, I think so. You because evidently they followed him uh, later on in life, and he retired a very wealthy man in New York State. Eventually he moved to New York City, in fact, Mike. So uh, Bill Diller was one of those mining kings that did extremely well, not like Caribou Cameron, uh, not like Billy Barker, who died a pauper. Uh, Caribou Cameron died a pauper. And uh, that, that story is repeated in all the gold fields of the North. I, I like that story so much. I think that there should be a universal word for, you know, you are a dealer. You know, a guy who would do anything for his mother. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Let's, Im let's encourage yeah. that. What a, that's great. Okay, but we, here we are in, okay. uh, in, this, in the caribou, and yeah. things are cooking. Well, things are cooking in, in other parts of the caribou, but as I say, there's still a decline in the, in the, uh, in the horsefly area. Yeah. But some people go back in there in the early 20s, and they decide that they will, make a, they will make a name for themselves by discovering what Ward had missed. Now, what, because he had discovered uh, gold in a hot spot, very, they decided to start drilling, and not only drilling, but putting down shafts. I got a photograph here of a drill. Yeah. And you know, I never thought about drilling yeah. in gravels. Sure, it's churn Doesn't drill. Is it, was it done a lot? Oh yeah, a lot, yeah. And, and look at, there's a driller on the Horsefly River. That's right, that's about 1920, and he's churn drilling down. He'd probably go down 60, 70 feet on that. And then if they really get serious, if they get any indicator, then they will put shafts down. The Miocene Company, for instance, put a shaft down, Mike, 560 feet and never hit bedrock. 560 feet. That's, that's 60 stories. 60 stories down. Down. And, and never hit bedrock. Never so hit bedrock. Now, bedrock you're uh, concerned about because that's where the gold lies. That's where most of the gold lies on bedrock or within be uh, uh, 18 to 20 inches. Bedrock sometimes a little higher or 
lies in a hide pan, which is a hide clay layer. Now, here is another. Uh, this is a map of the Horsefly River, yeah. and it's a sketch showing the drill holes near yeah. Harper's Camp. Yeah. And every one of those where it says 8C, 7C, 6C, yeah. all those are drill holes. They find anything in those well, drill no, holes? Well, no, because it hasn't got the depth in those drill holes, so they didn't hit bedrock. Whereas on the other side of the river, they did hit bedrock, Mike, and I don't know what the figures are. I see, say yeah, there. it says 2B, 17.5 sure. feet to bedrock. Yeah. 43.5 feet yeah. to bedrock. And the other ones, they probably went down hundreds of feet and never hit bedrock. So that just slid out of there. That was a, what we call an interrupted pastry. And we don't know where it goes. Did the river cut through it? Uh, does it continue on beyond it? You might drill all over that country and never hit it or miss it by five inches. Or sitting down there to this day, a foot of gold sitting on bedrock yeah, just 800 five. feet sure. down. Out of that, out of Ward's horsefly, I mean... 50,000 ounces, we'll, we'll assume, from the Chinese, and at least 50,000 ounces from R.T. Ward. That's 100,000 ounces of gold in a very small, restricted piece of ground. Yeah. You know, the story about Diller is wonderful. Yeah. Dunleavy's uh, pretty successful there at Soda Creek. Yeah. What happened to some of the other people? What about... Uh, well, Long Baptiste had an interesting... Uh, Long Baptiste was admired by white and Indian alike. He was very, very, very interesting and, uh, and clever individual. He turns up as the bodyguard of Guess Who, the famous judge in British Columbia. Matthew Bailey Begbie. That's right. Matthew Bailey Begbie has this huge bodyguard who considers himself just as important as Matthew Bailey Begbie and may indeed be. Well, imagine that because here is the most important representative of the That's crown right. and a much respected and substantial uh, native character. Well, yeah, much admired and who's not afraid to turn his back on anybody, knowing that he can... Armed or unarmed. Armed or unarmed. That's right. So that's that story. Yeah. How about any other characters that are up there? Well, What uh, happens to Ward? Does he yeah. just sort of disappear off? Ward, yeah. I, I don't follow Ward too much like I did J.B. Hobson. He, uh, he makes this one hit. I think he keeps most of it. I don't, didn't follow his history that much. There are a number of Wards, but I didn't, didn't follow it right through to the end, Mike. Okay. I've got one little tiny thing that I want to show here. Whenever we can <laughs> talk about gold in any way, I'd like to show it. Oh, yeah, this right. is a natural nugget in the shape of a beaver. Yeah, it looks like a beaver sitting on a piece of wood, and you can see the ears behind the beaver. It is really quite astonishing. It is. It's remarkable. Uh, there it is. It looks like that, that little critter on our I coin. Know, and it came that way. And even from the other side. It came out of one of my pieces of ground, actually, Mike. Yeah. And look at that. That's more than a nugget. That's a really a talisman, isn't yeah, it? Sure. That's just beautiful. And there's more where that came from on the river called Horsefly, our story today on Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. See you next time.